Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're enjoying your lunch. We're about to get started on with a discussion about something that I know is near and dear to the hearts of everyone in this room, about bipartisanship and getting things done for the people back in your communities. You know, we heard yesterday that the American public, Republicans, Democrats, independents, there are two things that they've told us, that they think that anyone from any educational or work background should get a chance to train for a better paying job. And they believe that across all parties. And they told us that they like when the two parties work together to figure out how to get that done for local workers and local businesses. That's not an easy thing to do sometimes in this current political environment. So when we have two members of Congress who have kind of put some of the other noise behind them and have recognized the need to work together on these issues, we got to give them a platform and recognition for the incredible work that they've done together. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So let me introduce our two guests uh, for this afternoon's discussion. Congressman Glenn Thompson is a Republican representative of the 15th Congressional District in Western Pennsylvania. And he's represented that section of the state since 2008. He's been a long-term member of the House Education and Labor Committee and the co-chair of the Bipartisan Career and Technical Education Caucus. Now, before coming to Congress, uh, Congressman Thompson, he had a long career in the healthcare industry. He was an administrator and a therapist. He even saw kind of workforce issues close up uh, in, that, in that part of his uh, career. And he was even a member of a private industry council. Congressman, I think you're probably, we're probably one of only a couple of people in this room who remember what a private industry council was. Uh, it's workforce board for the rest of you. Uh, that's what they call them now. Um, so the uh, Congressman's been on these issues for a long time. And with him is Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, who's a Democrat representing the 8th Congressional District in Illinois, which has been representing them since 2016. Props for Illinois. Pennsylvania is what? We don't give it up for Congressman Thompson. I'm from Pennsylvania. Let's hear it. Uh, prior to coming to Congress, uh, Congressman Krishna Murthy was a leader for the state of Illinois on affordable housing development. He was the state's deputy treasurer. He oversaw the state's technology venture capital fund and later served as the vice chair of the Illinois Innovation Council. Uh, he also co-founded an organization, Inspire, it was a nonprofit training organization training people for new jobs in the solar tech industry. Uh, he just recently moved from the House Education and Labor Committee, although we've been talking about how he's going to stay connected to those issues. Uh, he is on the CTE Caucus with Congressman Thompson, and he also co-founded the Middle Class Jobs Caucus. So why do we have these two gentlemen with us today? Well, together, they were instrumental in getting the, career, uh, the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act passed last year. They were the ones who worked on the bill in committee, in the House Ed and Workforce Committee, uh, that got it passed out of committee. It was passed unanimously on the floor of the House of Representatives. And then if that weren't enough, they then worked over to the other side of Capitol Hill to make sure that the Senate continued to move that bill forward to finally get us to something where we could have President Trump sign that bill into law in July of 2018. So these are two leaders who want to get things done. They're ready to reach across the aisle. They're ready to work on either side of Capitol Hill so that we can make sure that more people in their communities and your communities have the skills they need to compete and prosper. And so to have a conversation with them is my colleague, Katie Brown, who, before she came to work for National Skills Coalition as our senior federal policy analyst, actually worked for Congressman Thompson, and so she knows very much how those things work up on Capitol Hill, and we're looking forward to a great conversation. So thank you very much, and thank you to our conversation today. Thank you. Right. Oh. 
Thank you so much, Andy, for kicking us off. Um, I do want to start on a personal note of thank you um, to both of the members on stage with me today. Uh, before I started working for National Skills Coalition, as Andy said, I worked in the office of Congressman Thompson. I had the honor to do so as his um, legislative staffer handling education and workforce issues. And while I did know about skills policy when I started working for Congressman Thompson, I, I knew it was important, but I wasn't you know, as passionate as I am today about the issue. Um, and so I, I have Congressman Thompson to thank for that. He's an incredibly passionate member um, about these issues and, and a great leader, so I just wanna thank him. And then um, through my experience working with Congressman Thompson, I was able to have a front row seat to his work with Congressman Krishnamurthy and Congressman Krishnamurthy's staff. And they're also incredibly passionate about this issue. So I'm honored to be on stage with both of you today. And I think um, you heard the excitement about the passage of Perkins. We're all, as a workforce advocacy coalition, we're all very excited about Perkins. So, um, yay! <laughs> so as a jumping off point for our conversation, um, I just ask if you wanted to reflect on why Perkins was a priority for you, why skills policy is a priority for you in general, and then just talk a little bit about your work together to move um, Perkins to the finish line. Congressman Thompson, you want to start? Sure. Well, first of all, I want to just say how proud I am of this young lady. Uh, yeah. uh, she, uh, she did a lot of heavy lifting, and uh, this is something uh, that I've been working on since the very first day I came into Congress, sworn in January of 2009. You know, working on uh, this reauthorization, which at that point was so long overdue. And, uh, and I'm so uh, just pleased to be here uh, just to, uh, if nothing else, to, to be able to say these words. We passed the reauthorization <laughs> of the Perkins Act. Uh, yeah. uh, it is something I'm passionate about. It, it is about um, creating ladders of opportunity. Uh, I am a uh, I did serve on a private industry council. I am a recovering workforce investment board member. Uh, I grew up in a small family uh, business where I know that uh, the number one asset uh, was not the products we made or sold. It wasn't the location. It wasn't uh, you know the the tax attorneys and uh, lawyers that you needed for compliance. It was a qualified and trained workforce, and it is today's limiting factor for growing our economy. And so, uh, so this is something I've been very passionate about uh, from the beginning, and, and I think we're just in a, in a great place, although we have to be vigilant, and that's why I appreciate, uh, uh, appreciate this coalition. Now, this coalition was a tremendous partner at getting this done. I mean, Raj was a great partner, and, and we have a really strong Career and Technical Education Caucus, but believe me when I say we couldn't have done this without <coughs> And we need you going forward so that we continue to be vigilant, provide oversight, and quite frankly, continue to have other victories when it comes to workforce development. Great, thank you. Congressman Christian Morthy? Well, um, first of all, thank you for pronouncing my name properly. <laughs> You're welcome. I, uh, this is a true story. When I first started running for office in Illinois, I said, hi, my name is Raja Krishnamurthy, and the person looked at me and said, Roger Christian Murphy. Very nice to meet you. And then he said, I didn't know the Irish made it to India. <laughs> so um, in any case, uh, it's so nice to be here with the Skills Coalition. And uh, you know, you've been just tremendous partners in this journey uh, to get Perkins uh, reauthorized, Perkins 5 reauthorized. And um, the reason why it's so important to me is uh, two statistics that I would submit for your consideration. One is that uh, one third of Americans uh, have a four year college degree, but two thirds do not. And those numbers are not changing anytime soon. The vast majority of our friends, family, colleagues, and loved ones uh, will not have a four year college degree. On the other side of this, there are seven million unfilled jobs in the workforce, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, because employers can't locate the skills or experience necessary to fill those jobs. So if we want to really jumpstart our economy, turbocharge our businesses and private sector, the challenge is to provide a quality post-secondary education to those who are not gonna get a four-year college degree 
so that they can take one or more of those seven million jobs that are unfilled. And if we can do that, then the sky is the limit in terms of the potential for our economy and for our working families. Um, and so that is why I'm so uh, passionate about this particular issue. Before I came to Congress, I ran a very small business. Um, and uh, we make and sell infrared night vision military technology and solar technology. But the number one issue that we found that held back the growth of the company was finding skilled people to take the positions that we had to offer. And so um, I'm really excited about Perkins 5 reauthorization. I think that it's going to be a revolution in terms of how we uh, view and how we um, uh, implement skills-based education programs going forward and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, having you as continuing partners in the implementation later this year. Fantastic, thank you. Well that's actually a great segue um, because we now that you've finished Perkins obviously we're gonna ask you for something else. You know you can't <laughs> get out of here without that. Um, no but one of the one of the policies that we as a coalition feel really strongly about is the Higher Education Act. Um, we know that you know, when the Higher Education Act was first passed in 1965, the face of students looking for post-secondary education was very different than it is today. Today we have 70% of our students considered non-traditional, a lot of them are parents, a lot of them are working full and part-time while attending, um, attending post-secondary institutions. And so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about <clears throat> what your thoughts are on a path forward for the Higher Education Act. Um, do you feel like your colleagues also you know, think it's important? What are you hearing in your districts? And then what are your priorities in a higher education act? Uh, absolutely a priority. I was disappointed that, uh, that we were not able to advance the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act last year. Um, you know, it was a, it was a difficult bill. Um, it was, uh, there were parts of it that I understood the, the partisan divide. <coughs> but quite frankly, there were parts of it that were uh, bipartisan. And some of, the, um, some of the more bipartisan parts were uh, things like uh, year-round Pell, um, but, but also uh, really breaking in, uh, maybe for breaking new ground, uh, so that individuals that are pursuing career and technical education, uh, whether in whatever form that might be, uh, would be eligible for the types of financial support and assistance that we have seen folks with uh, you know, traditional four-year degrees be able to receive. Uh, Raj cited the statistics that are out there. Our economy is, um, our economy was built on, the, on these types of jobs. Um, and today to have seven million jobs that are open and available, and with the rate of in innovation and technology, and all compounded also with the fact of, of attrition, uh, with the baby boomers that are retiring in very large numbers, uh, it puts us in a, in, a, in a very difficult situation. You know, uh, businesses will probably close not because they don't have a great product or service or a great market uh, or a profit margin, but because they cannot find the qualified and trained individuals. And so I was very pleased with what we worked in, in the 115th Congress. And we're, I'm going to work hard on the Education Labor Committee to make sure it's, it's in the version, uh, whatever we do in the 116th Congress to include that type of career and technical education opportunity so that individuals who want to pursue uh, whatever education they need to get a better job, you know, to be able to get a raise, to get a promotion, uh, that, they're, that, that they're able to pursue that. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I'm optimistic that, on, uh, um, that, that the Higher Education Act can be among those things we could do in a bipartisan way in the 116th Congress and that career and technical education will be uh, well represented somewhat for the first time with, within that reauthorization. Awesome. Well, I, I echo what uh, GT said. Um, I think that uh, within the higher education uh, reauthorization, I, I expect and hope that uh, it will accommodate the increasing desire for uh, skills-based education to be part of the portfolio of uh, offerings at the higher education level regardless of what the setting is, even if it's a four-year college or university. Um, and so, uh, but in, on top of that, um, I wanted to mention just uh, two other things that I'm pushing forward in a bipartisan <coughs> way. 
One is uh, something called the College Transparency Act. And uh, this might be news to you, but there is no requirement that colleges and universities or post-secondary institutions provide data as to the outcomes for students that they graduate. Um, whether they are employed, uh, what's their average salaries, um, what are their career prospects, and so forth. And so we're seeing uh, an increasing drive for transparency on Capitol Hill in both sides. Like if we in Congress are going to be spending a lot of money um, helping to educate our young people uh, and, and uh, subsidizing, for instance, the cost of a four-year college or university or other post-secondary uh, opportunities, parents and the government need to know what do you get for that? <laughs> And students need to know so that they can make the right choices. So I'm pushing that very um, uh, zealously in this Congress. I want to make sure it gets, par it, it gets to be part of the uh, reauthorization. Uh, and then the other thing I just want to mention is the Foster Success in Higher Education Act. This is, again, a bipartisan initiative to try to help foster youth. Uh, with uh, accessing higher educational opportunities. As you might know, you know, a lot of our foster youth um, go through a lot in life, um, and there are a lot of transitions that they uh, end up having to undergo. Uh, and so sometimes they don't have the same assistance um, and, and pathways that uh, some, of, uh, some of us who might be more fortunate have. So this is something, again, that's receiving bipartisan support, the recognition that foster youth, people in foster care, uh, should also have access to the American dream, and um, that, in, that means having access to good quality post-secondary opportunities. That's good. Can, I, can, oh, if yeah. I can just follow up a little bit. You know, in the past 24 hours, I've met with uh, presidents of two different universities, uh, they're great universities, uh, mostly because they're in my district. <laughs> One of them, I'm alumni. Penn State. I'll, Penn State. <laughs> got a Raj. Um, and uh, so Dr. Barron had made a breakfast, uh, hosted a briefing this morning for the Pennsylvania delegation. And then President Mills from Mount Aloysius College, which is uh, a, a, new, in a new part of my district with mm. uh, recent redistricting. And, um, and both of those, I was Im impressed. Uh, they, they recognized the importance in the future. Uh, for an education system, one that's, that has portals to be able to come in and get what you need and then get out and then be able to get back in. And, and I was very impressed with both of those uh, universities' leadership as they talked about, and I heard things like uh, stack credentials. Well, I heard about, uh, um, well, the programs that Mount Aloysius does, they're already in the workforce development uh, business. You know, half of their students are a four-year degree and half are what they consider will be workforce development. And, and I think both are con very, very conscious of the fact that, um, that some of us have always been alarmed with, with some career and technical education happening in four-year institutions because it comes with a four-year cost. And that's the beauty of career and technical education, the affordability of it mm -hmm. and being able to enter into the workforce. And so just very impressed with the discussions that, that I'm witnessing firsthand. That was just past 24 hours um, that it's happening with, with our traditional four-year institutions uh, on those topics and a recognition that workforce development and specifically career and technical education is such a, uh, now a, uh, such a, uh, it's always been, but there's been a, you know, and, and that was part of what we worked yeah. on, making it a valid pathway to success right. in life. And, um, and right. just the, it's great to see those institutions embracing that. Can I pick, piggyback on Absolutely. that? So, um, first of all, the reason I knew which universities are in his district or colleges is because I actually went to his district did. and we did a joint press conference on this because we were just, we were knocking our heads trying to figure out how do we get this thing passed out of the Senate uh, because that's where the uh, roadblocks have always been. And so we thought, okay, let's do a, you know, um, uh, I, I went to his district, then he came to my district, uh, kind of a double header uh, press conference, and we got a little more attention to this. But um, one thing that came out, regardless of where I went, is there's still a stigma associated with yeah. skills-based education. And um, that's something that I hope that all of you um, uh, talk about openly and figure out ways to try to get rid of the stigma. And so in this uh, law, uh, that GT and I co-authored, there's money in there to start to expose 
students as young as fifth grade yeah, no. to the different careers that might come out of a skills-based education. Now, why do we do that? It's because there's this perception out there that manufacturing or um, other types of uh, uh, professions are dangerous, dark, dingy uh, places where you don't want your children to be. Uh, you want them to be in a desk job, in an office, or something <coughs> like that, and, uh, or in some kind of high-tech job. And the truth of the matter is, manufacturing has changed completely. You all know this. Some of these places are you know, in clean rooms. They are about as high tech as you could possibly imagine them to be. And so we want the children and the parents to be exposed early on so that they consider um, a, uh, a career that perhaps they might have closed their eyes to um, because of misperception. So this is something that uh, we're, I'm going to be, I'm sure we're going to be talking about a lot this, this year as we implement this law because we want to start to erase the stigma. And one last thing, um, I personally think that uh, a skills-based education is for everybody. And what do I mean by that? And you've probably seen this in your high school districts as well, but in our high school districts in the suburbs of Chicago, all of them now have incredible certification programs associated with their skills-based education such that um, let's say that you want to end up being uh, an engineer. You want to go to a four-year college for engineering. You might want to get an advanced <coughs> certificate in precision manufacturing by your senior year of high school um, before you go on to get that four-year college degree. And um, the reason why that's so important is it helps to enhance whatever degree you uh, pursue in engineering later on. But if you are one of the 44% of people who do not complete a four-year college degree, even within six years, you have something to fall back on. And that's important because at the end of the day, we need, we need pathways, educational pathways that lead to what I call the greatest anti-poverty program devised by human beings. That's a J-O-B, a job. Yep. That is the most important thing. We can't just be educating people so that they are educated. <laughs> we need them to get into a career and, a, as GT has said, a family-sustaining uh, job. So I think that's really, really important, and what you do is uh, vital for that to happen. I think that's fantastic. And I will say, you know, even when I started working on the Hill, I think my first year was 2011 or 2010, um, Nobody was really talking about career and technical education. Nobody was really talking about um, alternate pathways to success outside of a four-year degree. And actually, we had, um, we had sort of a plenary yesterday talking about new polling data that we mm. had just received that said, you know, the majority of Americans, regardless of background, regardless of age, um, really showed strong support for an increased investment in skills training. Um, and I want, so that's fantastic. And I think that's a testament to the work that you're doing too, because you know, the more congressional hearings that you, know, you ask a question about it or you, you know, increase awareness among your colleagues, we, you know, we could not thank you enough for doing that. Um, Can I say one thing? Sure. So GT, I'm eating my own pudding. Uh, <laughs> in my office, we are working with the local community college to create a skills-based constituent services program where we basically work with the co community college to create a curriculum where you don't have to end up having a four-year college degree to work in a congressional office. And so for the first time, <coughs> and so I'm proud to say for the first time we hired an individual without a four-year college degree to come into my office. He started just a few months ago and he's, doing out, he's just doing an outstanding job. And I'm, I'm, I, I hope that all of you as employers also consider how you can get in on the act, get in on the fun, figure out how you can work with your local institutions, and let's get more people uh, into the workplace with um, the ability to, to perform the jobs uh, up to snuff, but at the same time, uh, allowing more pathways to get there. And speaking of more pathways, I wanted to kind of pivot, because um, we talked about education, <coughs> higher education, and CTE. Um, obviously, work-based learning is something that is talked about a lot, um, especially apprenticeship. 
and we've seen um, the administration show support for apprenticeship. We've seen Congress allocate more funding for apprenticeship, which we think is fantastic. But I want to um, I want to sort of get your thoughts on whether or not you see that support continuing. Um, we know that apprenticeship legislation hasn't really been revisited in a while. Um, do you see that as being a continued priority um, on both sides of the aisle this Congress? Well, I, it absolutely needs to be. We know, um, you know, our and this, you know, what they say, what comes around goes around, and history repeats itself. Most of our successful industries that we have in our country were built through the apprenticeship program. Uh, I represent an area that has sort of, uh, it's a very rural district. It's, there's 18 members of Congress from Pennsylvania, but I represent 24% of the land mass of the state. And uh, we have, it really is the world epicenter for powdered metals. And I always, whenever I'm in conversation with these companies, and some of these companies are, are very old. They've, they've been around for decades. And so I've always asked the question, how did we get to be in this very rural area, the epicenter for, for powdered metals? And I was, I was blindsided by the response. And the response was, well, we built this business model based on the fact that we had high school apprenticeship programs way back when. And... Uh, and, but, and bringing these youth in, they, they learned skills, they had proper supervision, and then they, when they graduated, they went on and had long careers, and many of those initial youth are now retired. Um, and, but the other part that was just alarming to me, these business owners uh, talked about how if they had to start this over again with the state or the lack of apprenticeships, the status of apprenticeship programs in this country, it would never happen those industries would have never developed in my district or in the United States. And so, you know, we're, so this, so we're returning to a time where we're putting an emphasis on applied learning. And that's what apprenticeships are, you know, taking from the classroom and going out and be able to, to, uh, um, you know, to experience that. And there are some, uh, um, there's some, <coughs> some great legislation out there uh, in this area. I think there's a lot of interest in this area. So I'll put a shameless plug in for one of the bills um, that we have, and it's the, um, it's the Compete for the Future Act. Uh, and the Compete for the Future Act really is a, is a prize competition. We've used prize competitions in our, in our history. It is how we, uh, um, you know, the, the Transatlantic Railroad, the, the, uh, the, the initial design for the White House and and uh, uh, in the Capitol building. I mean, we have other examples where we've used prize competitions. And, this, uh, and so this would uh, reward youth in pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, Mr. Kelmer, a uh, colleague of ours who's a part of the Career and Technical Education Caucus is taking the lead on this and doing a great job. Uh, but that's just one example of how, you know, that's a piece of legislation that would uh, would engage you through prize competition in pre-apprenticeship programs that hopefully would pave the way for a transition into apprenticeship programs. They're incredibly important. Uh, we need to support these and, uh, um, you know, we, our world has been in the authorizing side of uh, government. We, we need to make sure that we're supporting this in the appropriation side, uh, that these programs are fully and robust, robustly funded as well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and, you know, and if you're, and I'm a conservative Republican, and you bump into folks that uh, are as good looking as I am, I guess, and, or no, <laughs> think the same way, you remind them there is no better investment in career and technical education. The return on investment with career and technical education is amazing. I mean, it can change and transform lives, but quite frankly, it, it can help people who maybe have been stuck in poverty for perhaps generations to allow them to have, you know, to, to get a, a firm grasp on that ladder of opportunity. And, and when they do, they, they get that job, and quite frankly, they start paying taxes, and, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great return it on is. investment. So this, is, this should be the, the uh, you know, the, the appropriations for these programs should be very bipartisan. They quite frankly have been. Mm -hmm. You know, we have in the most difficult budget years for a number of years now, where everything else we kind of fought over and holding status quo or cuts, uh, we have seen in uh, marginal, very marginal, 
But we have seen plus ups in these programs past number of years. Right. No, this, um, this, this area, I think, of uh, skills-based education, and certainly uh, Perkins, is one of the few areas of the Department of Education that is going to see an increase in funding. And um, I think that you mentioned earlier that uh, the last vote was unanimous, but that took a lot of compromise. I, I gotta tell you, it took years of compromise to get to a unanimous uh, vote uh, in the Senate and the House, and, and of course, to get signed into law by the President. Um, one thing I would say is that, is that this apprenticeship model is incredibly powerful. And um, we see that in other countries that have um, embraced it, such as in Germany and in Switzerland. Um, I'll just talk about Germany for one moment, but you know, essentially um, they have decided that not only traditionally blue collar uh, jobs should uh, allow for apprentices, but all collar jobs. Um, in fact, um, that's the, also the case in, Zer in, in Switzerland. Uh, their largest uh, insurance company has their North American headquarters based in my district. They have, it's called Zurich North American Insurance, 4,000 employees in my district. They had a really hard time finding claims analysts, okay? Um, these are people that would have taken actuarial science courses, um, and they just couldn't locate them. And so they decided they'd go to the local community college and say, okay, let's start a claims analyst uh, apprenticeship program. And so what they said is to Harper Community College, you guys devise the curriculum um, and uh, hire the instructors, and um, we will pay the people that are in that coursework uh, part-time uh, to come and work at Zurich uh, in the evenings or during the day. And then at the completion of this coursework, uh, those apprentices will earn a degree in business administration. It's about a two-year degree. Um, and also, they'll get another piece of paper called a job offer letter. And this program has been incredibly successful. And they've, they're graduating about 100 of these folks uh, from Harper Community College in conjunction with Zurich. And I think, again, this is the way of the future. It, I, I feel like instead of us um, you know, basically hoping and praying for the right people, to come out of our uh, high schools and post-secondary institutions to take the jobs that we have to offer, we're gonna have to roll up our sleeves, get in, uh, in, into partnership with some of these institutions and figure out how we can work together. And of course, our law um, actually incentivizes that, provides additional resources and makes sure that, you know, the, 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 that industry is at the table to help validate the skills that are taught and, um, and that the educational institutions produce people who get jobs. And so this is something I hope all of you take advantage of. And now is the time to start the discussions uh, because the implementation comes in July. So you have about five or six months to uh, really uh, uh, find your dance partners and, uh, and make this thing come alive. Thank you. Um, I, I, want, I know that we're running out of time, so I want to be respectful of that, but um, just as a last question, you know, we have a room full of fantastic stakeholders who do really hard work on the ground, business leaders, CEO <coughs> leaders, community college leaders, state leaders. Um, what, can, what can we as a coalition do to help you um, continue to champion our shared priorities in this space? Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Um, I think that you can uh, continue to be cheerleaders for skills-based education in a big way um, because I think that um, through your uh, incredible advocacy, you know, by the end of this uh, experience in which we got this uh, bill signed into law, we had 400 coalition partners that were actively working to get this thing pushed across the finish line. And so now that we have this great team that came together to get this signed into law, um, now we need to push toward successful implementation, and what are the things that we can do to make um, you know, the law even better? Because obviously there will be lessons learned as we implement, and then those will obviously lead to potential legislative um, fixes or additions. Um, and you know, I, just, uh, I think that um, the stigma issue, I think, is going to be the issue that um, we're all going to have to deal with in a, in a real uh, big way, especially with parents, 
uh, and students. Um, and, and, and now that we have some additional resources and additional paths uh, that employers can uh, take to help source their workers, now we're going to have to go to the families and the students and say, hey, have you thought about, uh, have you thought about this line of, uh, career, of a, a profession or a career or employment? Um, because that is really going to be the key to, to making this successful <coughs> in the long term. Um, yeah, I think we all need to hang together. And, and work hard to give career and technical education a triple A rating. So let me explain that triple A rating. Uh, that is appropriations, that is advocacy, um, and it is uh, uh, authorization. So um, in, in terms of appropriations, we, you know, that's sort of the next battle. Uh, we've, we've, got, we've got up an additional billion dollars a year uh, that on top of what we spend now for Perkins, for career and technical education. But that's what we've authorized. Uh, so we need to, you know, we need to, to work with the Appropriations Committee so that they understand the return on investment. They understand that the, the key to opportunity is education, and specifically it's career and technical education. Um, and so that is uh, that's something that we need to work hard to advance, I would say. Um, we also need to be working on continuing to deal with this bias and this stigma that's out there. And there's no better way to do that than to, to share real stories. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorite stories, <coughs> uh, I'm gonna take the liberties of sharing two with them. I, I shared these at the, at the 11th hour on the House floor when we were uh, passing that, that final uh, concurrence with the Senate bill. And the first one is about a young lady who, um, had some special needs. And she came into a, a program, it was a landscaping program at a, at a local uh, uh, career and technical education center. And she probably came in in 10th grade is my guess. And, um, and she came in and, yeah, <coughs> you know, she took that program, it was amazing. And she in particular did really well with the, the greenhouse side of that program. And the, uh, uh, the teacher there who worked with her was just so impressed with how she did, and, and the parents were just so proud. And this young lady had a Down syndrome, um, just to provide the full picture. And when she came time to graduate, she was a senior, you can probably imagine the, the stress and the anxiety the parents were dealing with. You know, while she's been in high school, she's done, she's done well, done as well as probably she possibly could, and this program was a big part of her life. And, they, um, and our career and technical education instructor, Mr. Joe Luther, a couple years ago, he was, uh, to no surprise, he was the National CTE Teacher of the Year. He went out to a local greenhouse and, and approached an employer and said, you know, uh, are you hiring? And the, the guy said, yeah, we could probably put somebody on. Business has been pretty good. He says, well, I've got this, I got this student that's graduated and she would be a rock star. You know, she's going to be an all-star. And she says, I want to, you know, I'll be, I want to be up front with you. When you interview her, it's going to be very clear she has Down syndrome. But she's going to do great things. You know, that a young lady's been working for that employer now for seven years and making competitive wages. Uh, you know, it, their, mo their parents are providing whatever support for transportation. But talk about transforming mm -hmm. lives, because mm -hmm. otherwise this, she would probably be on, on Social Security disability, you know, with, with medical assistance, and, and today she's just doing great things. And then there was a young man, they shared um, another favorite story. This, this young man, when he was in uh, ninth grade, up until ninth grade, um, it was, uh, it, all the teachers who knew him figured he was most likely, his future would be either welfare or prison which is kind of sad when you're in ninth grade. Um, but then in 10th grade, he got into the welding program. And he struggled in traditional classrooms. He just couldn't deal. I mean, he, when people were talking at him, he just didn't get that. He couldn't learn in a traditional classroom setting. But, you, uh, but he wasn't stupid. He's very smart and very intelligent because you put him in the welding program. And in the welding program, you, you have to know physics. You need to know math. I mean, and he excelled at that. He graduated after three years in the program, got a job right away on the pipeline. Now that's a, 
Pipeline is kind of a younger person's sport, I think. It's hard, it's hard work, all kinds of conditions. But he came back after his first year of employment, after that great career in technical education training, and I uh, saw Mr. Luther, and Mr. Luther was a bit of a mentor to him. He came back to thank his welding instructor, and he thanked Mr. Luther. <coughs> and Joe took the opportunity to ask him, he says, can I ask what, you're, what you make an hour? And, and it, yeah, this, this young fellow, he paused, and he sort of, you can see, I tell you, he's trying to do the math in his head. And he says, well, let's see. He says, last year, I made $170,000. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Mr. Luther, being a good mentor, said, hopefully you put some back in savings. <laughs> or no, he said, what did you spend it on? And he says, well, I, I got a brand new pickup truck and I paid cash. <laughs> you know, but it, it's, and I know those are extreme examples, but that's how career and technical education can transform lives. And we have to be the advocates to be able to spread the message in terms of, uh, uh, you know, about how th this, is a, this is a great pathway to success in life. And not just for kids coming out of high school, but for any adult at any age. It needs to be a system where you can come in and come out and get what you need to be successful. Uh, there, are, there are three bills I just want to plug that I wrap up. Um, just so you know that uh, the work continues in this realm. And I'm proud to be uh, working with uh, all three of these bills. Uh, the, the, uh, the first one is the, the very specific on the cybersecurity skill set which we see such a need for today. And so this is the Cybersecurity Education Integration Act. It's a Department of Education pilot. It creates competitive grants. It goes to employer education partnerships, that collaboration that we've been celebrating. And it integrates cyber, cybersecurity education into curricula. And that's, it's an authorization of $10 million under this pilot to do that. Uh, Congressman Jim Langevin and myself are the leads on that. Then we have one that this coalition has, supported, have been supporting and promoting, which we're so thankful for. Uh, we know we're on the right track if you, we've got your support. Uh, and that's the Skills Investment Act. Uh, that's a tax advantage savings act. Uh, it allows individuals to put money back in a tax deferred, tax advantage, advantage way so that individuals can invest in their own career and technical education going forward, whether it's a specialization, a certification, whatever form that might be. And there's provisions in there for employers to be able to contribute to that. And then, uh, and that's Mr. Kilmer and myself for leading on that. And then one that we're, uh, uh, as of this week, taking a victory lap on, uh, gonna be returning, uh, I hope we get an invitation back to the White House for this one, uh, for the signing ceremony. Um, and that is the FFA charter uh, um, uh, reauthorization or amendment. FFA is Future Farmers of America. Uh, they now go by just FFA because we have, well, for example, the largest FFA chapter in Pennsylvania, which is a huge agriculture state, is in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, so we amend their charter in a number of technical ways, but one of the most important things, changes we made in that legislation that has already passed the House, it just passed the Senate this week, will be going to President Trump, is that we close, more closely align their mission with career and technical education. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great organization. It's in a lot of communities and not just rural, but urban America. And it'll be a great, you know, be able to uh, serve youth well in terms of pointing out these pathways to them. That's excellent, thank you. That's a great note to, to leave us off on. Um, you know, it's just so wonderful that even though you've wrapped up career and technical education, you know there's still so much more work to do. And it seems like we're all on the same page with how important that advocacy is. So I just wanna end by thanking you both so thank much you. for being here. If we wanna thank you, thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. And for anyone watching us on Facebook Live, Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Let's give them a hand again. Wasn't that wonderful?
it's good to know that when you're spending time talking to folks up on the Hill, that there are folks who are willing to do the extra work that's required. You've convinced them, but they're willing to convince their colleagues to try to move some of these things forward. Um, it's just marvelous to know that we've got friends like that up on Capitol Hill. So speaking of friends, uh, I now want to uh, give some thanks to one of our partners who's been a long-standing partner in the sponsorship of our Skills Summit. Um, so the Siemens Foundation uh, has been investing in uh, both this Skills Summit for the past several years and also has invested in some of the work that we've been doing uh, in apprenticeship and work-based learning policy here in Washington, D.C. Now, most of you know Siemens as a company, and you know that it's been a leader both here in the U.S. and internationally in developing apprenticeship and training programs, not just to meet its company's needs, but really setting a standard for the rest of its industry. And through the Siemens Foundation, taking some of the lessons from what it is that the company has learned, the foundation in turn has been investing in a range of different programs at high schools and community colleges and other places, including making STEM education more available to young people through its STEM middle skill initiative, closing the opportunity for young adults in STEM careers. And so I have the honor to be able to introduce somebody who's at the head of both of those efforts, um, Barbara Humpton, who is the CEO of Siemens USA, uh, that's no small job. She's a CEO of a company of over 50,000 employees with $23 billion in revenue and good news for us here in the U.S., $5 billion in annual exports. Um, so that's great for our economy and it's great for those working people. And if that were not enough, Barbara also heads up the Siemens Foundation. So she's both a leader on these issues in her company and what she's doing in the day-to-day -day operations of that massive firm, uh, but she's also a leader trying to bring the skills message both in the investments that the foundation is making and in conversations that I know she's part of on a regular basis here in Washington, D.C. So let me introduce Barbara. Thank you, Andy. It is a real pleasure to be with you all today. And I know you've had a packed agenda. You have a lot to do to get ready for your day on the Hill. Um, but uh, I do, you know, as I begin my remarks, I do want to pause and say thank you for this great partnership with the National Skills Coalition. And when I hear about everything the National Skills Coalition is working on, I get really inspired by the synergies. We believe that the prosperity of businesses and the vibrancy of the American dream coalesces around the topic of skills and education. And as I look out at this room, I see the community that we need here in this nation to make that difference. I see the representation we need across the public and private sectors to develop a globally competitive 21st century workforce. And I know we have what it takes to close the skills gap, but just as importantly, to close the opportunity gap. This community working together to make a difference is what really matters. So I'm excited to talk to you about what I believe we can achieve going forward. Now, I'm here today representing a company that has undergone a significant digital reinvention. In the past decade plus, Siemens has gone from making its first acquisition of a software company to today becoming one of the top 10 software companies in the world. This change touches every part of our business, from power to manufacturing to cities and to healthcare. It's funda fundamentally changed how we work, from how we manage our supply chain to how we design big infrastructure projects to how we make and design products ourselves. The digital revolution might sound like it's all about technology, and to a certain extent it is, but what we've learned is it's really all about people. This moment in our history is a test to how committed we are to investing in people and developing new skills. This is why Siemens is investing 50 million annually in continuing education for our own employees. And this is why we've made it possible for more than a million U.S. students to access our software and hardware in their schools. And this is why we've expanded our own apprenticeship program for, for manufacturing into nine states. Siemens has 60 manufacturing, research and development, and digital sites across the country. 
and our apprenticeship program focuses on middle skill careers. These are skills that are going to give people, the middle class, a real leg up. And here's why I say that. The research and data tell us that college education has never been more tightly linked to success in America than it is today. Yet it also tells us that college education on the whole has never been harder to access for the majority of Americans, as we've just heard from our representatives. The Institute of Higher Education Policy found that the 70% of colleges are unaffordable for students who grew up in the middle class families, and that includes students who are maximizing student loans. But there's an answer to this, and I know many of you are helping to create this answer. We can connect more students of all ages to affordable community colleges and technical training programs centered on these middle skill careers. We can open doors to well-paying jobs in advanced manufacturing, information technology, energy, and healthcare that represent half of all job openings looking out to 2022. These are the doors that the Siemens Foundation, which I'm so proud to chair, is committed to cracking open. Back in 2015, the Siemens Foundation launched the STEM Middle Skill Initiative. Through this, the foundation began working with a number of national partners, government leaders, and educational stakeholders. We've invested more than $115 million in STEM workforce and education activities over this last decade. As a result, we've been able to expand work-based learning opportunities, such as new registered apprenticeship programs. We've, we've been able to help grow excellent community college STEM programs, and we've also supported a new generation of students pursuing career technical education. Yet, while we've made progress, I think we can all agree, we still have a long way to go. In this moment of historically low unemployment, the labor market continues to tighten. Open jobs remain hard to fill, and many of these jobs fall within the middle skills arena. So as we look to promote these opportunities, let me share a few things we've learned. First, young people especially are looking for more than a well-paying job. They're driven by purpose. As much as being financially secure, they also want a job that enables them to positively impact the world. So many STEM technical careers do provide that platform. Let's make that abundantly clear in our branding and messaging. Second, we face what I'll call both a stigma and a myth. The stigma is that those middle skill careers are old economy jobs. They're viewed as disconnected from the tech economy that is growing so quickly around us. And then there's the myth that the robots will soon take over. Folks, nothing could be further from the truth. We need to show in clear terms that middle skill jobs are integral to the tech economy. And critically, that new technology is elevating the role of the human. Now let me share an example that brings all of this together. Over the next 40 years, the world is expected to add 230 billion square feet of new buildings. Think about that. That's like building a new Paris every week. These next generation buildings won't just be made of bricks and concrete and steel, though. They'll also be enabled with software. They'll be connected to what I like to call the internet of really big things, and smart enough to operate autonomously. You might think then, well, maybe building technologies isn't the right field to enter into either because AI is taking over. But no, it's the opposite. People are vital. And in fact, the industry is facing a real skills shortage. There are currently tens of thousands of open positions in the building automation field. So let's break this down a bit more. These jobs pay well. Salaries for these positions at Siemens, for example, start at about $55,000 annually. These jobs are part of the digital economy. Technicians not only make repairs on site, they use machine learning and AI to diagnose problems. They also use electronic devices to monitor, monitor those sites remotely. And these jobs are purpose-driven. And here's why. Buildings constitute a giant sum 
roughly 40% of all global carbon emissions. Intelligent technologies, though, are the foundation to zero out this carbon footprint. So workers in this field won't just be servicing buildings, they'll also be on the front lines of the fight against climate change. So how do we connect people to these opportunities? What's holding us back? One thing we've identified is a lack of non-proprietary, portable, and industry-recognized certification. We also need more community college training programs to prepare new people for these careers. And I'm proud to share this with you today, the steps we're taking to change. The Siemens Foundation, our building technologies business, and the Association of Controls Professionals are launching a new workforce training program for building automation professionals. The Association of Control Professionals, or ACP, is the leading trade organization serving the building automation field. ACP will lead the development of the nation's first non-proprietary industry certification to train the next generation of building automation professionals. Then together, we'll create community college training programs as well as K through 12 career pathways that are aligned to those ACP standards. But we're not stopping there. Over the next year, the Siemens Foundation will expand its work to more Siemens business partnerships. We'll continue to address specific workforce challenges across industry, including healthcare and digital manufacturing. We'll work with industry leaders to identify talent pain points, and then we'll partner with education and nonprofit leaders to develop solutions. We're calling this new initiative SPARKS. SPARKS stands for STEM Partnerships to advance real-world knowledge and skills. It's bringing the philosophy of the Siemens Foundation and the knowledge of our businesses closer together to tackle a common goal. We're coming together to take decisive action to close the skills and opportunity gap both in the STEM fields where we work the most. This will not only address industry-wide workforce needs, it will address the broader needs of society. As we push this forward, we're going to focus on reaching traditionally underserved or underrepresented communities. We're going to bring new people and new talent into software-driven fields. So let me say this in closing. What I want to do is get people thinking about talent much differently than we do currently in our society. What I always say is, let's imagine a world in which access to education and training is as abundant as human capability. Today, I see people in this room who aren't just imagining this world. I see people who are working hard to create it. There's nothing stopping us. So stay committed to what you're doing, and let's continue to work together. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for Barbara and Siemens. That is true industry leadership, a very important part of the solution. All right, so um, you've got some time to start working on those little chocolate things that are there in front of you. Has anybody not touched theirs yet? Uh, you got time to now. Uh, and we've got a little bit of time for you all to get some networking time in before our next set of sessions starts up at 2 o'clock. Uh, and then you're going to be back here with us at 3.30 for that important time to prepare for your Hill meetings with your state delegations for tomorrow. So 2 o'clock for the breakouts, 3.30 back here. Uh, and then after that, our awards reception. So keep going, folks. Almost there. All right. See you in a little bit.